Hello, and welcome everyone to tonight's virtual Six to Celebrate his, uh, tour of Long Island City. We have Greater uh, Historical Society with us who will be presenting the tour. We have plenty of other virtual tours as well on our YouTube channel, which you can check out. We also have uh, recordings of a somewhat hybrid in-person tour guide as a virtual tour also available on our YouTube channel. We have our walking tour guides available at, at sixtocelebrate.org that you can access for free as a downloadable PDF, or you can order them. You get a packet of six, depending on the year, or you can also order by borrow. Again, that's sixtocelebrate.org, or feel free to contact HGC, hgc at hgc.org. Uh, and with that, I will hand it over to Bob Sickleton, who will lead tonight's tour. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, as Michelle has already introduced me, again, my name is Bob Singleton, Executive Director of the Greater Astoria Historical Society, which covers the uh, Long Island City area. Um, and it's our privilege to have the first uh, lecture, uh, virtual lecture with Historic Districts Council. Uh, so let's get going. Uh, we have a lot of slides, a lot of neighborhoods, a lot of stuff to cover here. So. Long Island City. What is Long Island City? What is Astoria Village? Well, Astoria Village started before Long Island City, 1839, 1870. Uh, it's the area that's around Hallett's Cove, uh, the area actually in yellow on this, uh, this, uh, this uh, map here. The red area, which is basically everything from 51st Street to the East River, from Newtown Creek to the Hell Gate, uh, is uh, the uh, boundaries of Long Island City itself. Uh, the main roads are Vernon, that goes along the waterfront, Northern Boulevard, Astoria Boulevard, both going to Flushing, and Steinway Street, which is in the heart of the, of the, of the city, which goes up towards the airport. The green area, by the way, is where the uh, North Beach in this map is actually the, where the LaGuardia Airport is today. Uh, it's comprised, Long Island City is comprised, New York is a really interesting system of hamlets, towns, and villages, and, and all that sort of thing. Um, Long Island City, as I mentioned before, is comprised of the village of Astoria, which was uh, from 1839, 1870, the lower picture there, the Eagle, village of Astoria, is the seal of it. Um, and there's other hamlets, Newtown Creek, Dutch Kills, Dominies Hook, Hunters Point, Ravenswood, Steinway, Middleton, Blissville, and the German settlement. Um, some of these are names of uh, like, for example, Blissville is part of Newtown Creek is, is part of Dutch Kills. Uh, the boundaries between each neighborhood is kind of vague. Uh, when does the story of start and Long Island City stop? You know, that, that kind of thing. Um, Basically, it's whatever you want it to be. <laughs> it's the way to describe it. And the upper corner there is the coat of arms of Long Island City. Um, and I won't uh, go into a discussion of how it was put together, um, but it talks about the city and the various elements that made this city great. So uh, let me just start to move forward here. And there we go. Now, I've noticed that um, HDC has uh, discussions, uh, Six to Celebrate, where they've talked about other um, notable features inside Long Island City, the Noguchi Museum, the Pepsi Cola sign, the Chicklets Factory, what have you. Since this has already been covered and discussed um, recently, we will not touch upon these topics here. In the future, if we're invited back, of course, uh, there's a whole slew of, of things we can discuss and uh, we can cover uh, the points that are here. The first part of this lecture, we asked uh, Michelle and the people at uh, HDC what they would like. They said, well, can you give us sort of a, an index as to what's landmarked, what are the communities, what are the notable features, and what have you. So what I did is I went on to the LPC, the Landmarks and Preservation Commission website, and I downloaded information. And I'm just going to go through a roster of the uh, neighborhoods and the um, notable places that are landmarked and one place that actually lost its landmark designation. Uh, first, of course, is the Hunters Point Historic District, um, a collection of French Second Empire and the Oak Rick townhouses, 45th Avenue, built between 1871 and 1890. It's also a United States Historic District. It's a beautiful block. It's really, really stunning. 
the next is, is, is as much as Hunter's point is sort of like walking through a, a Brooklyn neighborhood um, from the 1800s, going through Sunnyside Gardens is very unique because at that point in the 1920s when it was built, um, there was a lot of discussion about garden apartments, uh, sort of making a place look like um, having a lot of density, have a lot of green space, but not looking like the traditional block of, of uh, buildings that you would find in, in Manhattan or Brooklyn. Uh, Clarence Stein, Henry Wright uh, were notable architects who designed this area, it's 77 acres, and it's the first garden city in the United States. It is also a U.S. historic district. Now, that's it in terms of historic districts in Long Island City. Now we're gonna talk about the notable landmarks, individual landmarks. The Astoria Park and Pool Play Center, uh, one of those WPA pro programs that was started by um, Robert Moses, who, who was an avid swimmer incidentally. It's the largest pool in the system. Uh, it was actually his favorite pool. Uh, and it's in, a, it's in the side of uh, Astoria Park uh, between 19th Street and 22nd Drive. The, by the way, the 1930s and the 1964 Olympics trials, swimming trials were held uh, in that pool. This is a really, really beautiful building, the Bank of Manhattan building. So first skyscraper in Queens and up until the early 1990s, it was the tallest building in Queens. Now, of course, it is um, has to take a back seat to a number of tall buildings in Long Island City that sprung up in the last 20, 25 years or so. Um, it's a beautiful building. Uh, it has a fabulous basement where the, the bank, uh, the Chase Manhattan Bank used to be, um, is now part of the Durst Corporation's complex. They have a, they built a 60 story building behind it, the Sven building, and it transferred the air rights from the clock tower. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about what to do with this building, and we're hoping that, you know, maybe down the road it might become an art center, so, but to be continued on this. Um, the firehouse, the engine firehouse number 258. Um, it's on 47th Avenue in Long Island City, a Renaissance revival, built uh, in the early years of the 20th century. Uh, something built a bit earlier is the Lawrence Family Cemetery, it has 89 graves. Uh, it dates from the 1600s up through the early years of the 20th century. Um, scholars believe that they're, they're the, Lawrence, the original Lawrence House was right next to it. So, uh, and there's a road, 20th Road, it was originally a native path that went from Hellgate uh, to um, 51st Street and then from there went on to, uh, to Woodside and in other parts in, in Queens. Um, speaking of old places, the Lent Riker Smith House is the oldest house. Uh, there are other older buildings in New York City, but this is the oldest building that's still used as a private house. It's on 19th Road in Ditmars, um, built in 1729, also National Register of Historic Places. Uh, there is the Lent Riker Cemetery, uh, a private cemetery that's still on the grounds. It has a beautiful backyard, absolutely stunning place. And Marion Smith, the, the owner, um, occasionally permits, uh, has a guided tours through the property. So you can go to the website and um, check out uh, the next tour that she has. And if you have the time free, I would urge you to go to it. It's a very, really, really fabulous place. Uh, the Moore Jackson Cemetery um, dates from 1733, uh, another colonial cemetery. This is on the, the, uh, the border with Woodside. The Architectural Terracotta Building, uh, we'll talk about this later. Uh, the uh, Terracotta was the, the largest uh, building um, uh, material for facades in the closing years of the 19th century. Uh, there was a huge factory around it. Uh, all that remains is this building. It is, a, again, a New York City landmark. And there are people sort of waiting uh, for a number of decades as to you know, really figure out what they do with this building. Uh, the courthouse, a fabulous building. Uh, it was rebuilt in 1904. It's also the National Register of Historic Places. A number of famous uh, trials were held in here. This was the place that uh, uh, the uh, uh, that uh, is is uh, actually has a jail behind it, uh, which they tore down. So it was a very interesting place where you you know get arrested, to take it to the jail, have a trial, become convicted, and then go back to the jail. 
Um, another uh, older building, the Paramount Studios, building number one, the main building, which was built in 1920-21, um, also the National Register of Historic Places, is now the centerpiece of the Kaufman Astoria Studios. Pepsi Cola sign. Um, the Pepsi Cola plant was uh, a couple blocks away at the head of Animal Basin. Um, it's really interesting. There used to be a Coca-Cola sign on the East River Drive back in the 70s. And you look, you see that sign, and you look to your right, and you see the Pepsi Cola sign. Um, a really nice treatment of, uh, of uh, the historic fabric. It's now in the park along the East River. The uh, Manhattan uh, Queensboro Bridge, uh, the longest bridge by far across the uh, East River. Um, it's a double deck bridge uh, completed in 1909 and was a big factor in spurring the development of Queens. Uh, the clock, uh, which is now in front of Wagner's Jewelers. Originally it was um, uh, from a uh, jewelry, jewelry store or actually a time store back uh, up in the west side and they, uh, they moved it here uh, in the 1920s. Here. The um, Somer and Company Piano Factory, everybody knows Steinway is in Astoria, but the Somers uh, moved here. Somers specialized in upright pianos, Steinway specialized in grand pianos. There really wasn't much competition between the two of them. They all knew each other and had a friendly relationship. And you know, sometimes the workers would go to Somer and then uh, another Somer workers would go over the Steinway. Um, it was a, a, a piano factory up until uh, the, the 80s. Then it was Adirondack Furniture, and then about uh, 15 years ago it was converted into uh, luxury apartments on the waterfront. Uh, the Steinway Mansion, 1858. This was where the Steinways plotted building their piano empire. This is where Steinways plot, uh, plotted uh, the original Steinway Hall, which had a large place in creating um, uh, New York City as the intellectual and cultural capital of the world. And this was the failure. This, we had a, the Lowy's Triborough Theater. It was the last of the great theater, movie theaters. It was built in 1930 and was torn down in the early 80s. Um, I never, don't re remember seeing this building. Um, it went up to the Board of Estimates, but it was voted down and it was demolished. Um, but I, I do recall uh, somebody had actually donated to us as a door stopper, one of those tiny little filaments on the building. And I can tell you the thing weighs a ton. So you can imagine how massive this building was in it. Uh, an organ on the inside, which was saved. And I think somebody else now uh, has it. Um, but it was one of those great movie palaces of the 1930s. And people to this day regret losing this building. OK, now we're going to go through different neighborhoods. Uh, the village of Astoria, 1839 to 1870. Uh, and it's this corner up here, north, pretty much north of uh, Astoria Boulevard, certainly north of Broadway, and from about Steinway Street to the East River. This was the heart, uh, the original heart of the, uh, the development of the area. Um, we have a lot of material. Uh, there's a gentleman, Vincent Seyfried, who uh, really loved the community, and it was really one of the founders of the Astoria Historical Society. Um, and so what we have is a series of photographs of the buildings um, back when the landmarks law was passed and what's in those block and lots today. You know, it's really interesting when the 50th anniversary of the landmarks law a couple of years ago, uh, so many communities were proud of their designated landmarks. And since we had so few, uh, what we wanted to do then is to show what we've lost in the 50 years. So what you're going to see the next portion here are buildings that were standing when the law was passed and what is there today. Uh, maps of Astoria. This is the Astoria houses. This is the peninsula, Astoria Boulevard, goes to Flushing, Main Avenue. This Main Avenue, the Colonial Road, uh, dates from the 1650s. The Hallets had a farm here. Um, and these are very st streets here. This was really the heart of, of the, uh, right there, you can see a map from the 1870s. This was the heart of old Astoria. And uh, this is the Colonial Road, the new town, which goes to Elmhurst. And this is the, uh, the turnpike that went on to Flushing. 
And it kind of gives you a flavor of what the area looked like from these, these fabulous postcards. Uh, it was a really a tidy community. Um, and people were very, very proud. This was the first building really in the area even before Astoria Village. It sort of looks like a planters, uh, Southern planters um, uh, mansion. Um, you could have, you had a porch and around all four sides. And this was at the top of the hill and you could actually see all three directions, north, uh, the peninsula, the Israeli peninsula, where the East River went around, and then heading south towards New York. This building was around until about the 1930s when it was torn down. Most of Old Astoria is gone, of course. This was the man who started Astoria, Stephen A. Halsey. It's interesting, his brother um, started Astoria, Oregon. They both worked for John Jacob Astor, and they figured they could uh, start these enterprises. And Mr. Astor, who owned tons of real estate in New York, would appreciate their efforts and give them some money. All Astor did was to give them, uh, give uh, Stephen a few hundred dollars, which today is about, you know, maybe twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000. And he used that, um, and we'll show you what he built with it. This was his home. Um, he built it in 1840s, and uh, it later became a school, and it was torn down about 1945 or so. Um, they could not have schools that had wooden interiors. So unfortunately the building was destroyed. Uh, but I do, I did have an opportunity to sit down with a gentleman who went to school there and he gave me a picture, a drawing of the other floor plans of it. So at least it, we have that for permanently. Uh, this is the Astoria Institute. This is a really sad story. The Astoria Institute was, this is one of the earliest of the lithographs. Um, that uh, came out about 1830s or so. And uh, you can see here's the, the St. George's Church. Here is the uh, women's, uh, uh, they called it the Story Institute, the uh, female asylum, they called it, but it was a word they used for uh, any kind of uh, school or anything like that at the time. Uh, this was really the beginning of uh, the awakening of women where they started to go to school, started to learn things like science and mathematics and what have you. So this was really the very, very first beginnings of um, you know, the suffrage movement that culminated um, about 80 years later in, in voting. So it took women from going to these schools where they started learning things that their brothers learned at the universities to voting took about 80 years. Off the left is what the place looked like about 20 years ago. It was the rectory for uh, St. George's Episcopal Church and the building was torn down uh, under our protest and they built uh, a nondescript senior residence there uh, and named it for the Queens County clerk, Gloria D'Amico. Um, since then we've been begging uh, the, uh, the church to please give us some sort of photographs or a floor plan or anything of that nature and all such requests have been rebuffed. Um, really a sad thing. The, the stone wall there, that's something that you'd see in many of the colonial or the, the uh, Victorian homes of the area. Uh, another st sad story, La Roque Mansion, built in the 1850s. This gives you an idea, there's a lot of wealth here. And this was the kind of styles that people you built their homes. The, the styles was about 10 or 20 years behind Manhattan. So this was built in 1850. In Manhattan, these buildings would have been put up say, in the 1830s or 1840s or so. On to the right, you can see as late as the 1920s, uh, what uh, there, there was a whole row of mansions along a hillside there. On the left uh, was the Royal Oak Mansion in the 1960s. I mean, you can see it was already overgrown. The place really started to fall apart. I know a guy that, uh, when he was a kid in the neighborhood, they, they actually broke into the building and the place was already in shambles at that point. But it was really sad, you know, that we never really had an opportunity to see this building or was preserved, but the interior fortunately was preserved. And this gives you an idea of what the mansions look like. The Metropolitan Museum of Art in the American wing actually took elements, the fireplace and the, the molding and what have you from the LaRoque mansion to recreate what an upper middle class uh, wealthy person would have lived uh, in, in Astoria. So you had the, the men's lounge, the women's lounge, you had the, the dining room, the reception area, what have you. And this probably would have been the place where the, the family would have gathered um, on wintry nights with the fire in the fireplace. Quite a cozy setting, absolutely stunning. 
Now we're going to go through a series of buildings that were in, in place in 1965 when the Landmarks Law was passed and what replaced them. This is the Burr House, 2516 12th Street. Uh, there were a number of buildings that had this kind of design. This was uh, built about 1840s or so. And then you can see what replaced it. Um, another, this is the Trask House. Um, they actually, the originally house, this, this was a 1920 renovation. Originally, the house looked like some of the houses you'd see in Brooklyn built about that time. And off to the right is its replacement. Uh, another house uh, on 12th Street. 12th Street was just lined with these houses when I first got involved with the society. And um, I would say at this point, about two thirds, three quarters of them have been torn down. And even houses that are not torn down, like in 2018, this house was pretty original uh, to its, its, uh, you know, its, its past, except that it had asbestos siding on it. But on the right, um, they had brickwork done um, and got rid of the, you know, the, the fence and everything. And that's what it is. Uh, this is said, the Remsen house, one of the oldest houses, 1830s. And, uh, you know, it had eyebrow windows. I mean, this in, you know, is the kind of place you'd see in Brooklyn. Um, and to the right is what replaced it. Um, the Robert Brenner House. Um, I remember back in the 80s when I first got involved in this area, it had a beautiful uh, beechnut tree in front of it, beautiful uh, balconies. It looked like a southern uh, plantation. And of course, they got rid of all the greenery, all the trees and everything, and, and put in what's on the right. And at a street fair once, and somebody saw these pictures and they said, I live in that house. And he got kind of kind of, uh, well, unpleasant. Uh, another beautiful house torn down, 14th Street. Now, this is something that's really special. Um, that yellow house on the corner, I used to walk through this. This was the this was where the gardeners of the Hallett family. So this street was blocked off as early as the 1650s. And early maps that I have, even like the earliest maps we have from the 1770s during the revolution, and there was houses here, the buildings there. And I know a young man that lived in that building at the corner. And he says, as a kid, he used to play around in the dirt, as kids would do. And he found like a three cent piece, stuff like that. You know, and unfortunately, he never really got upstairs. When they moved out, he never got upstairs to uh, take a look at the house, um, you know, to see what the construction was of it. And by the time I reached, you know, contact with him, the house was torn down. I begged the people. I begged, I called a community board, I called elected officials, I called whoever I could, the local civics, what have you. I says, please, can you let us go inside and photo document the interior? Never got a call returned. That building is gone now. And you can see what's on the right is, is, a, is a new building. Um, there are still buildings, uh, the Willing Court, Rodman Flats, Willing Court's the 1830s, 1840s, built for working people, Rodman Flats, uh, it was a row of buildings built in the 1850s, and you can see extensions are being put on them. Um, and there's absolutely no interest in, in terms of preserving or acknowledging uh, anything about these buildings. You know, and the other interesting thing is that this is a, there was a, a fort built for eight War of 1812. Um, the, the British were thinking about sailing down um, Long Island Sound and approaching New York from like from Harlem, from the East River, and setting fire to New York. You know, they had burned down. Um, Washington, and they were about ready to burn down New York City. And New England at this point was ready just to secede from the United States and go back to England. I mean, the United States was ready to fall apart in the War of 1812. And fortunately, there was a General Ebenezer Stevens who fought in uh, the uh, Revolutionary War at this point, was the commander of the, of the Port of New York, had put together a series of blockhouses and fortresses. And this was named after Fort Stevens. But you'll notice that there was this, this, this barracks and there are two buildings that probably were powder magazines. This is the East River here. This is this is Manhattan. This is the Bronx. And of course, this is Queens here. And so I, when I used to walk through the neighborhood, I used to see these like odd buildings. Um, and I went back to the 1940s and I saw two buildings like this. And then I saw this other building and it had occurred to me, they were destroyed in 1995. And it occurred to me after I was sitting there one day, I got an aha moment and I said, you know what? It's these buildings from 1812. They were dragged up a couple of blocks and put into Astoria. And they were just destroyed. People had no idea anything about their, their past or anything of that nature. Uh, another interesting building. This was the schoolhouse 
where everybody got together one day in the 1830s and decided to vote to rename their community from Hallett's Cove to Astoria. So they were hoping to get some money from John Jacob Astor. Now, I had read that the schoolhouse was bought by uh, a police captain who lived next door to it, and he dragged it up the hill. Well, I, knew, I got the address from an 1870 map. This was his house. And the schoolhouse was back over here. And one day I was looking at this garage and I said, whoa, what is this? And my guess is this was the schoolhouse with the roof removed it is now being used as part of a larger garage. It, it, it's just, it's just incredible. You, when you walk around Astoria, it, it, you study this stuff. The, the, the stuff just kind of casually waiting to be destroyed. It's just absolutely amazing, this history. Um, this was a, a Robertson Trowbridge house. Uh, it was torn down it was along the waterfront there. This was a, they had a cemetery in the back of it here. And they put in a, a large um, housing complex and all the buildings have the same shape except there, this, there's no wing on this one. And this is the same cemetery. They just didn't build on it. And the really interesting thing is that one spring day, early spring, we went here and where the cemetery was, and I noticed green, very bright green streaks in the lawn. Now, I knew a guy as, a, as a, an archeologist and I said to him, I said, were those graves? And he says, oh, he said, probably they were. He says, we look at changes like that in the soil, in the, in, the, in the vegetation, which will tell you if soil has been disturbed. So he said, yeah, those are probably the graves. Absolutely amazing that, you know, as late as, as 15 years ago, you could still see where the graves are if you know how to read the ground. Uh, Historia Methodist Church, nobody has any idea when this church was built, 1840s, we think. I have no idea what the inside of this church looks like. It's just sitting there, and, and so many other buildings are dating from this time, and every year we lose a couple of them. Um, this is the Welling Court. Now, this is another house that is on maps when the British were here. You know, was this the, the British had a large garrison here during the, during the American Revolution. Was this their, uh, their headquarters building? I have no idea. I think it is. Um, but, you know, I haven't had a chance to get inside of it. And you also find little orphans like this, you know, remnants of roads that have long been paved over. Um, and there's an old farmhouse stranded in a modern street grid, probably built about 1820, 1830 or so, and it's just kind of sitting there quietly in this big plot of land. Uh, and also, you know, this was a Surrey Reformed Church, 1837. This church was replaced in 1890. And this building, and I've actually talked to people here that are members of the church, actually attended one of their uh, meetings of their, of their uh, uh, church governing body, you know, and I introduced myself and I said, I'd like to work with them and COVID hits, but they believed along with me that this is the 1837 church quietly sitting there as a public room. And this is the interior of it. Beautiful, beautiful ornate woodwork and um, you know, work in, in the ceiling. And also look at the fabulous um, church interior, the stunning gla stained glass church interiors. You know, there, there were a number of churches here and um, you know, you, you look at these buildings and you know, the dwindling congregations and you just you know, wish that you could come up with some sort of adaptive reuse of these places. As a matter of fact, the Astoria Presbyterian Church, um, which had moved to uh, 33rd, 34th Street uh, near Broadway, uh, you know, membership started to dwindle and uh, they had a pastor there that, uh, you know, decided that uh, convinced the people uh, to, to sell the property so that the money could go to the, the Presbytery, which is the governing body. Fortunately, um, there are a group of people that really value this stuff. And that is the um, Latter-day Saints, the Mormons. And they uh, purchased the windows um, they had heard about our struggle to maintain the church. They reached out to me and I assisted them in terms of research on this. And I offered to do anytime they want any assistance uh, to get in touch with me. And they actually installed these windows in a temple. Now, once a, a temple is consecrated, a non-Mormon cannot walk into the, into the buildings. So they offered to fly me out to, to Bravo, Utah, back and forth from New York uh, as their guest. Uh, in the ceremony just before the, 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 the temple was consecrated. I could not for a number of reasons, but it was a compliment of the highest degree. And it's really great when you see in your own community how neighborhood is being, you know, pretty much 
uh, wantonly, carelessly, casually, use your word, destroyed, to have somebody that's not even associated with the neighborhood value your, your heritage of your community. Uh, and they actually had a, an, an exhibit for about uh, two years at their B B Brigham Young University Museum of Art. Um, and these were the windows that was from that church. So it was a really nice, really nice thing. Really nice thing. We have some pictures now of what the area looked like a uh, hundred years ago, what it looks like today. This is Historia Boulevard on 28th Avenue. Um, again, these are the houses. You can see how the beauty of the place originally was and how it looks today. There's still some, some remnants of the neighborhood. Here's another, uh, another area on 14th Street. You know, fabulous. I mean, it, it, the Chamberlain Taylor House, uh, when I used to give tours, public tours, I always used to showcase this place because it's one of the few buildings in Queens that had brick. Uh, and it's again, it's interesting because the house style is the kind of style that you would see in Brooklyn or Manhattan in 1820. And it took like a couple of decades for those styles to come out to Queens. Uh, and every other building in the story of village is, is, is wood. Uh, and this is the only building that, that is brick. Um, used to have a, uh, have a block out front where they used to mount the carriage. It's, it's a nice, it's a nice house, nice building. And then you find other buildings like this that people have walked by. This is all that you can see from the side street. And this is a, a, a picture from like 100 years ago, the Lockwood Mansion. So this section that you see here is this section right here. It's facing, facing the street. There are still you know, gems, uh, whenever there's a Jane's Walk or something like that, we will take people through through the community. So you still find nuggets like this, but I mean, it's like, you know, 10, 15% of what used to be there. Uh, these guys bought the Craig Bayless house and it was a rooming house and they resorted the guys on the right. This is our, our predecessor in historical society and uh, things really, you know, you can see what they did with their house. It kind of gives you an idea of what all of Astoria Village could have looked like. And it's just sort of sitting there, this island of beautifully maintained island. Um, and, you know, at some point uh, they, you know, may just pull up stakes and sell everything. Um, and the destruction continues. I mean, this is uh, the Grand Mansion. Uh, this is an old postcard. The house was built in the 1840s. It also has pillars in front, as you can see. It's this building that's uh, in the distance. And um, a couple of weeks ago, somebody posted something on social media. And I says, oh, no. Uh, so I had friends I knew that lived out there said, can you find out what's going on? And they found out that the guy that bought the mansion doesn't live here. He just ripped off all the siding. And it's probably going to be destroyed like everything else. So this is what it looks like right now. OK, uh, so much for Astoria Village. There are other parts of Astoria. And um, one place I'd like to discuss with you are Matthews Motto Flats. We were fortunate to meet the family of GX Matthews. In one year, in 1914, that family had 25% of all permits, building permits, in the borough of Queens. Now, there is developers and there's developers. GX Matthews came to America from Germany for politics. He was, we believe that he was a socialist. And it's interesting, he was a socialist and a developer. He built his homes for one people, for working people. He was very successful. As a matter of fact, a Metropolitan Life Insurance came to him and asked him to build housing for them, one of them being, um, you know, Stuyvesant Town. And he looked at the information, he looked at their, their, their demographics that they were going to um, sell to, and he said, I'm not interested. He says, that is middle class. That's not working people. So what he did is he built homes like this throughout Ridgewood, uh, throughout Sunnyside, and throughout Long Island City from about 1890 to about 1930, and actually through uh, Elmhurst through the 1930s. Now, I, I selected these buildings. They all had grape leaves in their, in their lobby. And the family told us this wonderful story. World War I broke out. He had all of his money or a good portion of his money in Germany. He did not want his money in Germany. He was afraid the government confiscate money, especially concerning his political views. So what he did is he took all of his money, he purchased wine, he exported wine to a neutral country, Switzerland, under letters of credit, sold it in Switzerland, and took the money to the United States. Now, at that time, the United States was a neutral power, so Germany could really do nothing about it. 
but he took that money and he built dozens of buildings. And this is one of the buildings here that you can see on the right. And every one are grape leaves in terracotta. Uh, these are some buildings that he built a little bit later. Uh, these are along 30th Avenue, but you could just see this guy just built home after home. And he's, these buildings, each one's had like their three stories. They had uh, six families, uh, their railroad apartments, they had dumb waiters. They were, you know, the buildings are, are built to, to this day. They're, they're absolutely strongly, they're overbuilt. Absolutely incredible buildings. And this was the block in 48th Street that he built the, uh, from the money that he got out of Germany. It's fabulous. Every, every picture has a story. And if you can find the story uh, like this, uh, it, it's, just a, it's just a wonderful thing about our, our community that has such, uh, such great, great history. And Bohemia Hall is another place that should be uh, restored. Uh, or should be given a landmark status. It was was restored. Uh, it was a place that was falling apart. Uh, you know, the the Czech community moved out of the of the area after World War II. Um, it was a wonderful story. They when they built this place, they they put, they put it in, they built it in 1905, and then they finally built the beer garden in 1917. Everybody said, oh, "You're crazy building a beer garden. Prohibition's about to come in." They didn't care. They said the beer is so important to us. They drink, drink more beer than water in the Czech Republic uh, that they actually bought one of the last beer licenses in New York City. That thing cost like $300, which by today's standards would be like $15,000, $20,000. They didn't care. And the story was told the last night there when they could drink their beer. And this is, you know, just ripped the heart out of their culture. And everybody just sort of went home, but they kept that license on the wall. And that license stayed on the wall until they took it down for protection about 2005 or so. Uh, and I wrote a really nice story about, you know, the last, the last license. Um, it was falling apart in the 1990s. They were using it for ethnic festivals and people complained in the neighborhood. They were trying to get them to sell it. It's as though the Cuban festival had too much noise and this festival had, you know, too much litter and uh, these people didn't drink beer. And, you know, and what, what happened is the historical society got involved we sat down with him. He said, you know what? Cold beer, hot night, good friends make sense in 1895. And everybody nodded. He says, well, guess what? It makes sense in 1995. Open it up to the public. And he says, okay, what can we lose? This was the beginning of the beer craze. This opening up of Bohemia Hall was the first opportunity for people that came, they lived in New York to go to an authentic, 19th century beer garden. Most of them had long disappeared. This place was still there almost by accident. And this whole beer craze, the craft beers and all this stuff really started. And you can see there, I mean, these young people in this place, I mean, this is, you know, they, they, they always have beer gardens for old people and stuff. And you can just see there's a whole new generation discovered the, the you know, wonderful, the, the lager, the Pilsner beers from the Czech Republic. And uh, we have a lot of great stories about this. And someday I will do a lecture on the beer gardens of Queens. Steinway community up near uh, LaGuardia Airport. Uh, the Steinways wanted to get out of New York. It's interesting. They were, even though they were socialists, uh, they were having a lot of labor problems. And they also were constrained. They had a, a, an industrial place right off of Park Avenue. And most of the industry actually started going towards Times Square. So they, they realized they really couldn't expand any further. So they came out to Queens. They bought like, you know, 90 acres uh, paid top dollar for it. I mean, these guys had money just, you know, um, just, just, just an incredible success story. And they decided to put together, again, they were socialists. They left Germany because they were not given, the father, Heinrich Engelhorst Steinweg, had to make pianos in his wife's kitchen because the authorities refused to give him a license because of his political views. His oldest son actually had to flee Germany and come to New York during his revolutions in 1848. And he wrote back to his family, he says, you've got to come to New York. This is the place to be. This is a wonderful place. You know, everybody can be free, can think their, you know, discuss things, think ideas, do whatever they can do. Well, Heinrich at this point was older, you know, his, his, his kids were pretty much grown up, took the whole family, picked them up, came to New York, and they were an overnight success. To this day, if you hear a piano in a concert being played, 95% of the time, that instrument is made by Steinway and Son, either in their Hamburg factory or more likely 
in their Astoria, Long Island City factory. So they had a prospectus here. You know, you, you, just because you're socialist doesn't mean you're, a, you know, a, a, a savvy capitalist. You could be both. And so what they did is they had this land. They, they said, look, a great place for, for, for working men to come here. We're going to build good housing. We're going to put in schools. You're going to be along the waterfront. You know, you can have, you know, a, a, a recreation. You can have a fireproof factory to work in. You know, you'll be treated with respect. They still had strikes and have what have you left and right, but it was a it really an incredible opportunity, and it was not a company town. Henry, I knew Henry Steinway, um, and he used to bristle about the call. He said this was never a company town, and I myself I grew up in near you know Pittsburgh, and I you know I can tell you about steel towns and all that stuff. No, this was not. This was a settlement. This was a a, a community where both management and workers lived together and um, it worked to really make this a success story. This was a prospectus that was given out uh, to prospective people. These were the lots there showing, he put in out of his own pocket transportation. Um, there's a park here, this was the factory, there was the waterfront, this was his mansion, and all these lots were open for uh, working houses. We're gonna watch that, we're gonna take a look at this. But we get, before we get into this, I'm gonna talk about interesting study, we were given an opportunity at the Steinway School, PS84, to work with some of the students to teach them about their community. So they knew their community, they knew where PS84 was, they, their families lived in these houses. So what could we do? Well, we had a bird's eye view, which are very popular of areas, this is 1896. We traced out the street grid, okay, 1896. Now we used a NASA satellite picture of the neighborhood, took the grid, and superimposed it. Once we had the grid there, then we took a regular map and superimposed it. Okay, and there, here was the school, the school, and there's the school. And around here were all the buildings, the notable buildings, and down here was a listing of all the points of interest, the stores, the churches, everything of, of, of interest. Now, here's a close-up of it. You can see there's numbers here. This is Steinway Street right here. Okay, you can see that every building uh, is put in. This was a uh, another factory that uh, was was uh, near uh, the, the the factory, uh, the Steinway factory, because they also attracted industry to the area. This was a listing we made of who these companies were. This was their numbers, and this was the old street addresses, and this was the modern street addresses. And then what we did is we worked with the students on connecting them with their with their neighborhood. We had an ES class, ESL class, and then, you know, these are grammar school kids. And we showed them how they made a piano. You know, we took, uh, their, their teacher was really great. We had bits of cardboard, what have you. And we created a piano. Now guys, this is really great. I know that the, the president of Steinway and Sons, um, just, I see him all the time and I give the tours at the factory. Um, and so I, I, you know, I asked him, I said, would you be interested in meeting these students and have them present their, their piano to you? He said, that sounds like a wonderful thing. Unfortunately, two weeks later, COVID hit. And that piano that those kids made is still sitting in a, in a closet. I'm hoping we can, we can still get something like that done. Uh, so the Steinway community was one of the first places where people were looking for a, uh, um, you know, landmark designation. And, you know, again, people talked about it like they talked about old Astoria and you always had one or two people that said, I don't want anything. I don't want anybody to, you know, I, will, you know, I don't want anybody to tell me what to do with my house. And that's all you need is one person to do that. And everybody says, okay, they all took a step back. So this, this area never became landmarked. Um, most of the people that I talked to think it was a tragedy. They're trying to keep their homes up. But you know, I tell them you can't have it both ways. You know, you, you either for it, uh, and you'll find people that work with you, or even though you say you're for it, if you do nothing, you're against it. Um, there is again from the map, we've been able to identify commercial areas along Steinway Street like this. This is uh, again then and now pictures. One from uh, the uh, the 1890s, another one from like 20 2015. They had model housing for their people. It's absolutely amazing. And again, no records. You know, I'm working with, a, with an architectural historian on trying to identify this. 
I give tours of the neighborhood and I had a one, I had a couple from Switzerland and they looked at these buildings and he said, you know, this looks, there's like a Swiss influence. So I mentioned it to the researcher. I said, see if you can find an architect from, from Switzerland that's, you know, so, you know, we're, we still haven't found anything, but I'm sure we will if we keep on pushing. So the neighbor is just littered with, with examples like this of housing. That was workers' housing. This is middle-class housing. I understand the interior of this house is absolutely stunning. Um, this is on 43rd Street. And then you come to situations like this where you had two buildings. One was like this with, with a mate going the other way. And one was like this. And at some point, about 15 years ago, somebody got to two center buildings and they did this. And that's all I'm going to say about this, this particular slide. The Modern Art Foundry, which uh, is one of the leading world art foundries, uh, they have um, uh, stuff all around the world. Uh, if you go to the Alice in Wonderland uh, sculpture in uh, Central Park, that's their work. Uh, they're the sewer at the garment center of a man sitting uh, at a sewing machine is, is their work. They have worked all around, they're one of the world's leading art foundries. And, um, this was their, their factory. We're going to do a program with them uh, later this year, early next year. Uh, and it was originally one of the Steinway stables. So they're just down the, just down the street from the Steinway Mansion. The Steinway Mansion, um, even though it's protected by landmarks, we had begged the Halberian family to please work with us. We could get funding to buy it from them. We wanted to maintain the mansion. And they decided not to do anything about it. And they sold the mansion and the land around it was not landmarked. On some places the land is landmarked. They did not landmark the land here. So this is what the mansion looked like. It was surrounded by almost like a private park. And this area in red are warehouses that was built uh, by, by, the, by the developers who really didn't buy the house for the mansion, but bought it for the land. And this was approved by the Landmarks Commission. There are buildings here, have tie irons under the mansion and they're within four feet of the mansion. Okay, Dutch Kills. Uh, this, is a, this is actually one of the oldest areas. This, this dates in the 1650s. Uh, it was known because there were tide mills here. The Dutch, Kill, Dutch Kills uh, was uh, actually a retirement place for the, uh, the Dutch East Indies Company uh, that's how it originally got its name, but uh, there was a, a tide mill that was placed near where Queens Plaza is. We don't have pictures of the tide mill, but we do have the pictures of the of the Miller's house, uh, the painter house. And I, I've actually met the painter family. Uh, and they were responsible for when the, the house was torn down in 1861 because the railroad went through what is today's Sunnyside Gardens, their initial tracks. They uh, rescued uh, the millstones and they put it in front of their house. Uh, when the house was torn down about 1905 because the area got to be developed, uh, they gave the millstones to the uh, the bank, the, uh, the, the Chase Manhattan Bank, the bank building, and they were put as decorative millstones in the sidewalk. So this is a picture from 1930 from a book, and you can see the millstones are in pretty good shape. Well, here's what they look like in 2010. You know, and again, they're, they're out here in the traffic. I'm sure cars went over them. This is, you know, this is the middle of a big parking lot and there were two stones. Then one day we came by and we found a big fence and there's the one of the stones around it. And we had heard that there was a project where they were going to uh, completely redo Queens Plaza. There were no discussions with us about it. Um, and we were absolutely horrified that these, mill these millstones were suddenly now part of a construction site. This is what they had, you know, this is what they looked like. Uh, this is one of the last pictures we took before the construction site. And then we found out that they were sitting, when they removed them from the ground, they were sitting in this crate. And I was very, very concerned that somebody would come in and take them. And so we had a commu community meeting. Um, we made a lot of noise about them. And so the powers that be then moved the millstones to safekeeping at the public library branch. Thank heavens they did that. And then when the millstones were ready for installation, um, they gave uh, diagrams like this. And I said, wait a minute, this is the millstone. It's unsupported here on either side. And are those pins being driven into millstones that are a couple hundred years old? 
what? What are you doing? And that's exactly what they did. They put the millstones on pedestals. And here you can see, you know, this was Queens Plaza. Here's a guy on one of the benches, you know, sleeping. Um, you know, these are, these are millstones a couple hundred years old for heaven's sakes. Um, and then pieces started coming off them. And uh, one of our friends that has a newspaper um, wrote about the cookie monster grabs a bite from a Dutch kills millstone. And uh, this is a, you know, a broken piece. We got in touch with the parks department. The parks came and the guy at the time said, you know, historical artifacts really should be put in the public places. But he says, this is what we were told to do. We'll, you know, we'll do our best. So they glued the piece back. Thank heavens they did. But then look at this, you got graffiti over the stones. And a really sad story about it is that one of the painter uh, family members, an elderly woman came with her family uh, to take a look at the millstone. She had heard they were in a, in, a, in a park and she saw this and she called me, she was absolutely brokenhearted. Um, she passed away a few months afterwards, um, but you know, it, it, this is totally, a, totally crazy to do something like this. And here's the stones that this was actually taken um, by myself about a couple of weeks ago. This, the buses go along this lane. This has salt, the salt sprays on the stones. There the piece fell off again, as you can see. Here's another piece. There's a, a little path next to it. Um, it's, just, it's just sad that these, these stones are being treated like that. Ravenswood, uh, another courier and eyes print. This is what Ravenswood was supposedly, is supposed to be the waterfront of um, the area. Now, Ravenswood originally had a house uh, built, we think, from the 16, 1700s of the Blackwell family. Blackwell was the old name of um, uh, the uh, Roosevelt Island. Um, there was a door on this building, and you can see there looks like an arrow. This was carved by the British when they confiscated this house. We tracked this door down. It was sitting at the Brooklyn Museum uh, warehouse. Uh, for decades, all but forgotten. And they said, if you want it, you can take it. So we actually have it now. It's waiting to be reinstalled in our collections. Um, this is the Delafield House. This was where the treaty ending the Revolutionary War. Uh, Delafield was a, was a merchant. So the uh, British Parliament, since they had no relations with America yet, gave it to this merchant since, you know, New York's meeting in New York City, or the United States is meeting, the Congress is in New York City. Take it, you live in New York City. Take it to Congress. This is the treaty, you know, that we've we've uh, signed. So it was stored at the Delafield House um, in 1791. The treaty of Treaty of Paris was brought here. Now, once they were ready to develop this area, it was farmland. It was next to New York. They said, "Okay, let's see what we can do," because uh, parts of Brooklyn are being developed. Uh, New York's being developed. So um, Alexander Jackson Davis, which is a famous architect did a series of renderings like this uh, in the 1830s of these really fabulous Greek revival mansions. I mean, this is an incredible, it's like a mansion, Greek revival mansion instead of a, a Doric mansion, you know, Doric temple. And um, we actually have the documents from his, his collections. And he went to the landowners in Astoria, or in, in Ravenswood, and asked them, he said, would you want this? And they said, well, how much would it cost? And he quoted a price and they said, no, thank you. Because here, unlike New York or unlike Brooklyn in Queens, you had um, builders um, that could had these catalog books that you could select your windows, select your, your siding, select the shape of your building, and they would run work teams through and build these houses. So um, you don't have, you have master builders, you don't have architects. And that's one of the problems now, once you get away from, you know, the Fifth Avenue or get away from Gramercy Park or what have you, where you used to have architects like Alexander Jackson Davis out to Queens, you've been places like the, the Steinway Mansion where nobody really knows who built these buildings. We read newspaper accounts, people have come forward saying that their, their family has built these things, we report it, but it doesn't get printed. So I think I know some of the names of people that had built these, these buildings. Um, and they did fabulous jobs in some of these, 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 these buildings. You can see right here, there's a Delafield mansion um, when it was later modified. These are the gingerbread houses that you would find. This is a classic 1840s, 1850s. Um, this was the, uh, the house uh, that um, Ebenezer Stevens lived in. Um, 
that uh, defended, uh, defended uh, the uh, New York from the, uh, the American Revolution. I mean, he was, he, you know, he had a granddaughter, Edith Wharton and what have you. So there's a lot of, a lot of old family uh, that lived in Astoria Village in its early years. The other interesting thing is that uh, you see a lot of greenhouses, like you see here in the right, a lot of gardens. A lot of these families later moved out west, went to California, went to Oregon. And the big thing by gentlemen, uh, farmers, if you will, is that they had these greenhouses and they would start to do hybrids of fruits and vegetables. And one of the things that um, I'd like to get some research done are like the, the apples of uh, the, the Northeast. They, they might have been cultivated by initial strains developed here in these greenhouses in uh, Ravenswood, because you know these families moved to Oregon. Same with the grapes in California. So that's something, an area that we're going to be doing some research in the future. Bodine Castle, fabulous building. Um, and this was around until the 1960s when Con Edison bought the lot. They said, let's make this a landmark and Con Edison tore the building down in a space of like a weekend. And here's the New York Architectural uh, Works. There is the building, there it is today. Um, and this was the factory in the background. Hunter's Point, uh, this was the area that's between Newtown Creek. We're gonna go a little bit faster now. Um, this is interesting. I got a call that uh, the landmarks, or I got a call that the city was going to be removing this fountain and making the street go straight by the courthouse. And this was the rendering with the fountain removed. So I got in touch with, you know, so, some local civics and people and I said, folks, this is, you know, something going to happen. Um, why don't you make this a landmark and keep the fountain there? It's just a beautiful, refreshing place. No response. So my understanding is that the they're in the process right now of dismantling this fountain. It's a shame because there was a fountain here um, since the earliest courthouses in the 1870s. Uh, row houses in a store in uh, Long Island City, Hunters Point. No uh, landmark designation. Um, this is the landmark district here. Um, but you know, beautiful structures like the the the, the church, not landmarked. Uh, eclectic um, apartment buildings. Um, and this is an interesting uh, street here. This, this is a wealthy area. And an interesting backstory on this was they uh, had asked the people, says, do you want uh, streetcars or do you want uh, elevated trains? And they said, uh, we'll take streetcars, you know. And they said, oh, we just, we just abolished the, the commission, uh, the public hearing commission, and the board decided to put in streetcars. So these streetcar pilings of, the, of this buildings are, are sometimes about three or four feet from the stoops of these, of these buildings. Imagine having streetcars rumbling overhead uh, night and day. Sunnyside, Sunnyside Gardens, a famous place here, 1924, 1928. Um, there are 66 buildings on 12 blocks. It was built by Clarence Stein, Henry Wright, part of the city garden movement, one of the most successful examples here. Um, this is a, a landmark district, as I'd mentioned before. It's really interesting. This was the nursery of Greenwich Village. People left here. Um, all those people, they, you know, like around the world, world War I, all those early Bohemians got married and they moved out to Greenwich Village. And of course, they were all communists and what have you and socialists. And the Depression hit and in 1930s and they couldn't pay their rent. And there was a lot of stories about them being evicted and their, and their friends taking their furniture and bringing it back in the back windows. <laughs> uh, Phipps Garden Apartments. Uh, this was a, uh, a building that was uh, put in by uh, the Frick family. They were uh, wealthy um, steel, uh, owns steel works in, in Pittsburgh. And again, in that time when families had lots of wealth, there was a, a feeling that they should give back to the community. And they put in these wonderful working man's houses, Phipps Gardens Apartments in 1931. Okay, failed community preservation efforts. Um, this is, that's myself on the right there. We were talking about some of these projects. This was the community trying to protest uh, de over development. Just some quick examples here. The Luminaire House, uh, which was a historic building. Uh, they wanted to put it in Sunnyside Gardens in 2013. Some people were divided. Some people said it's it's a ad to, could be a future landmark, something for our community. Other people said it doesn't have any relation to Sunnyside Gardens, so it was rejected. 
Uh, this was the Steinway Mansion. This is what the grounds look like. And on the right, you can see in a space of uh, what, uh, one, two years, uh, what the lawns look like and how they put in the warehouses to replace the, uh, the beautiful park-like setting. This was the Elks Lodge. This again would have been a fabulous clubhouse for the community. Um, and uh, people heard about it too late and the building was torn down. There was a lot of uh, protests and to no avail. The, um, even the Sunnyside Gardens, the garage to the gardens, the idea was that, that you would not need a, a car, just park it in a, garage, a common garage. So the garage was near the edge of the gardens, but it was never landmarked. And there was an effort to save the garage and then they came back and said, well, we need, uh, we need schools. So the entire garage was ripped down. Supposedly, their elements of the facade will echo the garage. Um, I don't know. Right now, we, should, we just have a foundation there to replace it. The Dolkin House. Um, this was, uh, the, Ferdinand Dolkin was the person that Henry Steinway brought over to start music education in this country. All the, the, the music conservatories owned their, their um, uh, existence to Ferdinand Dolkin. He also was the person who put together, booked all the acts. He's the person that got the people coming in from Europe to, to New York. He played a very big role in making New York the intellectual and cultural capital of the country. Now, the, the tradition was in these houses, there was a, 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 a music room where they would have artists come in and, and play. So, and I actually went into the building on the right before it was torn down and saw the room, ornately beautiful room. It was a rooming house in its last years. We asked to uh, could they please consider saving this. This was not even given any consideration of a comment from any, any, anybody that could save it. So we end up by talking about the role of historic preservation. People say, oh, you save houses. Yes, but what else do you save? What else, where is the, what is the greater meaning to this than saving a building? Well, you can save commercial structures. You know, on your left is a, uh, a fabulous uh, uh, a building that uh, was, was uh, reinforced concrete that was a model of commercial buildings. It, it uh, uh, had great lighting, it had great ventilation, it was cheap to run, you, you could sublease it. It was really the, the, the epitome of a commercial building along the sunny side, along with the sunny side yards. I mean, that's a lecture in itself. Um, and there, you know, I was, I, a friend of mine was a, was a wealthy person who um, took this picture back in the 1950s. He's passed on now. But I look at this picture and you know, people say, oh, it's just a bunch of buildings. And I say, you know what? It's more than that. It's a bunch of dreams because every building is somebody's dream, somebody's idea, a success story. Um, and that really is really the heart of creativity. Uh, you know, creativity is more than just the arts. Now, we do have much, we do have the arts here. I mean, there's the Kaufman Studios, there's Steinway Piano. So yes, arts is part of this idea of preservation, but there's much, much more. See, what's happening right now in Long Island City is it's becoming New York's next city. It's the new center of New York. I, when I give tours, if you go to my Facebook, there's a picture of me with a group of people and I have the New York City skyline behind me. And I did that on purpose because I said, we're the heart of New York. You know, and I tell people, look at that skyline in New York. No other city has a better skyline than Long Island City. So now we're talking about water, the water how's the waterfront going to look? You know, give a sense of place the creation of cohesive character of the, of the community. What about the core? What about the uh, comprehensive strategies for affordable housing, economic opportunities, job growth, infrastructure, services? Fortunately, people are now thinking about these things. You know, before things are put together willy nilly. So this is a really once in a lifetime opportunity that a new community is arising from its past into its future. We also have a transportation survey, a lot of discussion. You can see how this, this area, if you're familiar with it, has changed dramatically in the last 10 years, much better than what it looked like when it was originally planned back in, you know, 1910 or so. And now they're talking about the Sunnyside Rail Yard plan, where they're talking about, you know, 
decking the Sunnyside yards and creating an entirely new neighborhood in the heart of New York. So now they're, they're taking listening sessions, they're putting together a master planning process. So uh, the initial master plan was released um, last year, um, but you know, with COVID and everything, everything's kind of at a standstill. So the point of this lecture, the point of this discussion, the point of this thought, uh, when I was, HDC had asked me, Bob, can you do a lecture on Long Island City? And I said, what is the place of historic preservation? It should be something that is an integral portion within the heart of every future plan for a community. It should never, ever be an afterthought. And that, I think, has been the problem so far in preservation. When you see a building, it's endangered. My goodness, we got to do something. <laughs> My friend, somebody looked at that 10 years ago and put a plan in place, and it's not what you want. So when we put these wonderful plans together, when we craft this, you know, this 21st century city, Long Island City, New York's next city, the cradle of creativity, the place of tomorrow, we have to integrate within it neighborhood historic preservation. Thank you. I can take your calls now or take your, your, your comments or questions. Anyone has any questions, you can put them in the chat or because we are a small group, uh, if you want to unmute yourself, you can. They're so overwhelmed with the uh, amount of information you gave them. <laughs> No one? Questions? I, I left them all back at Ravenswood. <laughs> oh, well. They were like, oh, God, that was a lot. <laughs> oh, this is just a, a walk in the park, folks. OK, well, I, I thank all of you for uh, sitting through this uh, tirade, lecture, uh, ennobling moment, whatever you want to call it. It's been a real privilege uh, to have an opportunity uh, to uh, work with uh, an organization like Historic Districts Council. Oh, I see one little chat. What do we have here? Yeah. Did you mention Queensbridge and Reese House? So important. No, I didn't. Um, I, I was, as you can see, I was already constrained by, by time. Uh, Queensbridge is, it was the largest um, public housing complex um, in, in certainly within the country. Um, but, you know, I, I, I will be mentioning that in, in the future. I did, I did mention some of the, uh, the other types of housing that was put in for working people. Um, and, uh, you know, the fact that this, this was a consideration from the word go in this area, that it should be a community from all kinds of backgrounds, from all kinds of people. Um, and, you know, one of the working people is, is, is really, uh, you know, the goal, making this a home uh, where the people can be attracted to come and uh, could, uh, could raise their families. So thank you. Uh, the next time I will go into this in detail. Anyone else? So. Um, any case, thank you all for the um, attending, sitting through the lecture, and I hope to have an opportunity to work with Historic Districts Council uh, again in the near future. We can do all five boroughs, all kinds of neighborhoods or what have you. So um, with uh, no other further comments, I wish all of you to have a good evening, and thank you, Michelle, for hosting us. Thank you very much. This was great. It was a wealth of information that was amazing. Um, as I said in the beginning, this has been recorded, so it will be available on our uh, YouTube channel if you want to rewatch it. We will be working with Greater Astoria soon again on our um, virtual Far Rockaway tour. We also have a book talk coming up later on this week on Thursday about uh, Wallet of Astoria. And then at the end of October, we have a in-person walking tour of the Lower West Side. And I have a bunch more virtual and in-person tours that will also be coming up. So keep an eye on our website, hdc.org. Check out all our emails. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for coming. Have a good night, Good evening. Bye-bye.